Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Porto. Welcome to Portugal. Welcome to the fifth forum of the Vasco da Gama movement. Um, bless you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Catarina Matias. I'm a family doctor here in Portugal, in Coimbra, and I'm very honored to be here with you. Um, uh, I, I'm going to introduce now uh, Professor uh, Jao Metzemakers, that is going to introduce the speakers and the theme that's going to be very interesting. Thank you. Well, welcome to this session, which will be on the topic Stronger Together teaming up with patients. And uh, as Katarina said, we have two speakers, two keynote speakers. First of all, we'll have the presentation by Professor Amanda Howe, who is the Wonka World President. And secondly, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Salome Azevedo. She's a partner in the Patient Innovation Prep Platform. Originally, Professor Helena Kanyao should be here, but she had to cancel. But we are very happy that you are willing to step in and give a presentation. So, can I have had Professor Amanda Howe to give the first presentation? And we move out to the audience so we can follow the presentation also. Thank you, Job. Thank you, Mai. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, as we said, giving the first talk. I go quite quickly because I've seen the slides from the second speaker and they look really interesting. <laughs> but I hope you will also take something from mine. So, you know me, uh, but some of you don't know where I work. I work in the far east of England, the closest city to Amsterdam, called Norwich. And we have a new medical school, uh, quite new, the graduates, just the first 10 years. And it was my privilege to be uh, involved with creating that. So if any of you come our side, you're very welcome. Please get in touch with me. Let's start by making the framework for why teaming up with patients matters. This is the big picture. We know many deaths. Many people could live longer with better quality of life if they had better conditions of health care but also better economic conditions and life chances. So there is a link between being poor and being in an under-resourced situation or with poor employment or poor life conditions and developing illnesses earlier. And that's not just about lifestyle, it's many different factors. So in terms of Wonka and its mission around equity, you can see that we have some special challenges to um, discuss. And we know that inequities arise from many different socioeconomic situations, by gender, by race, by uh, class. And then it becomes a vicious circle. So if you, you know, you're born prematurely underweight because of some avoidable maternal situation, and then you, uh, it's a little bit damaged at birth, and then the school goes badly, and then you don't get the good job, and everything goes uh, difficult. So you become a vicious, it's a vicious circle, if you see what I mean. And on top of that, for finances and for health systems people, then they say, well, it's expensive. So if we could avoid these kind of perpetuating health problems, you know, people have a better life, they can earn more money, you know, then it doesn't cost the system or the government so much. So at a very basic financial level, which is not my main driver, but people also want to prevent this kind of problem. So these are the big contexts that we're working in right now. Some of the challenges, I want to start with the difficult areas. The balance of power, let's be frank, most doctors are seen as having a good job, a good income, high status. Patient may respect that, but often people will feel she's different from me, and they will be a little bit nervous or maybe even somewhere a little bit angry that um, the doctor is separate from them, the doctor is different. And then when we are patients, when we are ill, we are dependent. You know, there's, if you start to get symptoms and you think, oh, what's happening? You know, there's a lot of uncertainty. You feel vulnerable. Even I, you know, in my privileged situation, when I am sick or when my member of my family is sick, I really need 
the doctor to get this right, and I am vulnerable in that way. So the power balance, again, shifts in that situation. I'm talking here about what I call psychodynamics. If any of you don't know that word or don't learn about this, please do, because it's very, very relevant to your practice as a family doctor, and I will talk a little bit more about that. But however good we are at dealing with this power balance, and I'm coming back to that and teaming up with the patient and how to make it more equal, we also have the challenge of multiple demands. So I may be a marvelous doctor, but if I have only three minutes with the patient, a lot of my skills will not be used very well. And that brings us to the question of whether the system supports us to make a real alliance with patients and with our community or whether it does not help us to do that. Some of this may be a financial barrier, so the question of pay out of pocket, whether we see, or whether the system makes us see our patients as our customers, uh, not our clients, which is a little bit different relationship. And this, in some countries, let's be frank, I'm told by my colleagues, leads to distrust. So the patient is worried, the doctor is doing this not for me or my family, but because they need to make money. So some very big issues and some very challenging areas when we're really thinking how equal am I with my patients and how much can I work closely with them. Then let's flip to how to overcome this. So this is a general slide about what is the framework. First of all, I think it's a question of your my personal competencies. Are we really patient-centered? What, you know, what is the attitude that drives us? How good and flexible and appropriate and adjustable are our communication skills? What is our emotional intelligence? How do we use that with our patients to make this work together? As well as what clinical skills do I have? What knowledge do I have? What are the technical competencies of my profession? So a good basis for working well with patients needs all those areas, us to be competent in all those areas. And then, as I've said, how does the system help us? So uh, the accessibility, the ways that the patient can actually contact us, how well does that work? I'm going to put this chat down. Sorry, darling, I think you're very sweet, but I can only see this part of the audience. So I'm saying, um, he can go off and practice his football and I come back to him later. Um, so yeah, so how accessible is the doctor? Do the people feel that they can reach them through technical means, money, you know, cultural? You know, do they feel that we are in the same place or that the doctor is very different? Um, what space do we have to do the job and whether we have the relationship over time? So again, you know, quite, I can make a, a new relationship with somebody, but if they can never see me again, how can we team up together for effective care? And that takes me to the team and the community. So the final part of the framework is, does the whole situation work for, for the community? You know, maybe I'm not there. Here I am, I'm talking to you. Somebody else is doing my clinic, but they will know Abraham or they will know Jane as just as they know me, and they will know our nurses and our receptionists and our healthcare workers. So, you know, the team together is what the community can relate to. And also we expect to address the needs of the population, not just what comes through the door, but the things that are out there and need reaching. So that's my framework for the strong team. I said yesterday I would talk about universal health coverage, so this is talking about the system first. Very quickly, this is what universal health coverage aims to do. Provide all people with access to the needed healthcare services right across the spectrum from prevention, cure, care, rehabilitation of a good quality to be effective that doesn't expose the person and their family to financial hardship. And the strap line is care that is accessible, affordable, acceptable to people and effective and continues over time. Okay? But when you're talking about universal health coverage, guys, please just think, okay, what are, what are they saying here? What is this actually going to mean in my country for my population? Because you know, 
these are the questions to ask. So you can take this slide and put it in your back pocket and use it later. Who's going to be covered, actually? What are the rights to coverage? How is this going to be covered? What is the package? Where do you go to get it? How accessible is it? Who is there to deliver it? Are they an acceptable and effective, well-trained workforce? What have they got to do the job? How are we going to make that system work over time? So the governance side, the management of the interface between primary and secondary care, and why are these choices being made? So UHC is not a, a one size. We have to make sure that the package actually does work, and that will make a difference to the barriers that I said earlier. That's why I'm pointing it out here. So going then to how to create the conditions to make this work, the overall service package will work, but the other big thing is education and training. And these are some of the things that I think are essential for students, young doctors, residents, and upskilling of family GPs if we're doing continued professional development. Are we giving the students the chance to learn from patients? So when I did my medical training, I went for one week in six years outside the laboratory, outside the university, outside the hospital. And mostly in the hospital, I was seeing very sick people in their beds. The liver failure in bed 23, that kind of training. Now, my students, week one, year one, go to a family doctor's clinic to meet patients, to start to learn from patients, to learn how to speak to patients, to learn how to have that dialogue. And we recruit patients are very keen to help their doctors learn. So learning from patients about patients, getting community placements, and getting those in different communities. <laughs> So not always going to the same kind of people, but to make sure you go in urban and rural and different, you know, mix of pet population in your place. Making sure that while you're doing that, actually you're giving the message, patients are, you know, they are the people you're trying to help. Being humble, teaching the students to really respect people so that the culture emphasizes you're learning to be a doctor to help the people that social accountability, developing the professional and interpersonal skills accordingly, and then learning to deal with the more complex side, again, the interpersonal side, the complex comorbidities, and a big emphasis on equity. So people say to me, my, my school doesn't teach me about public health, but the modern family doctor, the modern medical school will say, think about the gaps, think about who you're not reaching. Can the patients help us to learn how better to engage with those needy populations. So those are the sorts of conditions that I think we need to really make a strong team with our patients. And there are many, many things on the internet to show you the sort of competencies of teamwork. So if you want to go off and read more about that, you can find some very good authoritative models to check your sort of um, domains of learning. And those are just a couple of examples. Now, how do you know if you're doing it? How do you know if you're becoming a good team player with the patients? First of all, I think you will see people express it as a value. They will talk about it. They will say this matters to them. You will see them concerned with um, the well-being of their patients and population. So, it's a choice. I'm saying, you know, it's not, you, some doctors don't care about this. That's not what preoccupies them. So you, in people who are really interested in working with patients, you will he see it in how they talk. She's, you know, we're equals. Okay, I'm a doctor. I had a university education. Lucky me. But, you know, this is another person and we're in this world together and I'm going to try and work with him or her to make this go better. What are their beliefs and what is the evidence? Well, one of them is that actually what we do together today will influence the outcome. And there is good evidence for that. If you really get on the same level with the patient and they understand why you're recommending, what you're recommending, they go out and are more likely to change how they behave, to challenge the things that are making them sick, to go and get the tablets, to actually go to the hospital. You know, it's not rocket science, this stuff. 
And then the other way you can recognize is who are we, how much are we advocating for this? How much are we working to change or improve the services and the system? So if you have those system barriers, and we were talking about this in the Aspire Leadership Workshop yesterday, how much time do you actually spend pushing back to try and make a difference to that big picture? And then how good are you about actually adapting your model according to the person in front of you? And I think if you are interested in how much you team up with the patient under these things, you can monitor all these characteristics over time in your place. So let's then talk about our team and our place. Collecting data is part of our job, but not just how many patients we see or how many blood pressures get checked, but what do the patients think about the service we give? So PROMS and PREMS, patient-recorded um, experience measures or patient-recorded outcome measures. How much do our patients feel that we actually took their views into account when we set the outcomes? And there are measures in the systems, big measurement industry. I don't have time to discuss that, but it's something that Wonka is involved with. But to make sure that we have this side measured as well as the more technical side. And um, in my country, for example, all our patients have a satisfaction survey and the practice gets rated on how our results come out from that. And this is something our government now requires as governments, which is okay, actually. How much do we actually bring patients to give us advice about our services? So many practices in my country will have a patient representation group where people come routinely uh, to say, you know, whatever it is, can't get through on the phone. Great that you've got an extended hours evening surgery because now I can come when I come home from work instead of taking time off or after the children have fed and all these things, giving us information and helping us. How responsive, I mean, how much does our team really put time aside to think about how this work is going? How much time do we spend picking up problems that have arisen, that significant event audit, like complaint or an avoidable admission or whatever, actually spending that time because something happened that was bad for the patient and we want to learn from that. And similarly, the principle of audit is also part of actually teaming up with patients to make things better, although it's a sort of slightly technical task. And then the more interesting model, I think some of you have done this as uh, exercise the community-oriented primary care projects. So Jan de Meissner is, you know, the great father of this discipline, but doing this bigger picture of local needs or responding to things, you know, we're noticing the kids are all eating fast food. Let's have a conversation in the community. Let's analyse how much that really is a problem out there. Let's look at how we can change it. And again, when you decide which of these brilliant projects to undertake, are you actually doing them with the most vulnerable people, the people who are least likely to be pushing on your door saying, this isn't okay, doctor, I want to change it. So, but also to be a good team, you have to look after yourselves and you have to make your working climate productive for um, everybody in the team Otherwise, you can't do any of these really good things. So that's also something about work-life balance and being conscious of that need for yourselves and your colleagues. Okay, so then if we want to work in partnership, how do we do that? Well, I've said it's in every room. You know, I call you through. I've never met you before. The way I invite you in, how I open the consultation, how I listen what sorts of questions I ask, how much I understand who you are and what is going on, that all starts the team between you and me. At the next level up, how does the clinic work with the community? How much do we have these links, these structures? Be responsive. How much do people feel that we really are on their side? How much do we work with the other agencies? So good teamwork actually will involve us reaching out to our social work colleagues, our hospital colleagues, the NGOs, the, you know, charities in our area, the social care support groups. Um, so really not just, oh, I'm the doctor, so I know best, but working together for this. 
And then also working with our local academic providers, I think, is also a way of teaming up with patients because if you get the evidence, you do the research, you, as I was going to say, use the patients for teaching, I don't mean it like that, but really help get the public to help us to train our residents and our students. That's a really big um, lesson, I guess, or gesture to them, and they see it like that. Working in advocacy groups, supporting our patients, you know, Maybe the doctor isn't the best person to go to your local government representative, but you can take your patient group and encourage them to go and give their voice to an authority that they didn't think they could talk to before. And then, you know, reporting on this, showing accountability for actually the services you give and creating resources. So I've seen some amazing examples of uh, clinical groups who add to the resources of their community by doing all sorts of different, you know, applying for grants, doing sponsored fun runs, you know, once it starts you can imagine many things. And these become civil society actions, you know, they're not just me as a doctor, it's a question of what we can all do together as citizens, being human. Okay, are there limits to the time metaphor? I'm getting the red card now, so I think I've only got two slides, I'm okay. Um, I think being part of a strong team with the patient relies on not being too much self-interested. You know, there is an altruism in this. That's part of the value. Acting with integrity, avoiding corruption and bias, and acting in the best interest of the patient. Sometimes that actually does mean taking an authoritative position. Sometimes doing the right thing for a patient involves saying no or even withdrawing. We were talking earlier a little bit about patients who have very difficult psychodynamics. Sometimes we have to avoid dependence and avoid, you know, over neediness. It's a complex area. We could talk about that in a workshop. And sometimes we have to make a decision that says we can't do all of this. You know, we have to prioritise that we can't, haven't got the resources to do whatever. Structural barriers can disrupt how we work as a team and if you haven't got a workforce, so the bottom line is, have we got family doctors? Have we got primary care work? Because all this is empty talk if there is no workforce. So, family medicine, are we the discipline most likely to be the patient's partner? I'm gonna say yes. We're not the only people who can do this. Of course, every health professional should be working broadly in this way. But because we're the first line of contact in many systems, because actually making the right diagnosis and an effective management plan requires you to be in the team with the patient, then we are the ones who do it. The over, over ongoing relationship and the values that we emphasize. And also usually, I find primary care quite a flat hierarchy. You know, it's not like the hospital. It's kind of, we're there, you're there. Let's see where we go together. So here are some of the people who we're actually talking about. Being on their team, being where they are, getting them the services that they need, giving them a voice in the system that helps them to be healthier and here are some of the people who are doing it. You can put your photo there instead. The challenges for us, as I said in my opening remarks, are actually making this voice again in the current climate as we move to the 40th anniversary of Almaty, making sure that people do understand what family doctors do and uh, getting our alliances right to make our voice heard. So again, with the patients, with the nurses, with the other workers, not trying to keep hierarchy, but to do it because it's right. And I think there is an important role here for the Young Doctors Movement. So I look forward to discussing that more with you over time. Thank you very much. Am I staying, staying up here or coming down? Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, it was a wonderful starting point to get the discussion uh, initiated. I would like to ask everybody to put 
their questions? Nobody. Comments? Oh, God. Thoughts? Help? Well, I can start a little bit, no? Somebody is also start. there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, please. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I'm, I feel so inspired now. Um, I'm Vanya from Croatia, uh, and I wanted to ask you about your experiences on uh, which are the barriers for uh, doctors to pursue broader uh, community involvement mm. at the moment. Yeah, good question. I've been increasingly concerned for my own country. Any of you from the UK, again, we should talk about this because I see much better examples in some other place than what we are doing. One of the barriers is that this is, in a sense, not acknowledged in time. My colleague in Uruguay has one half day every week specifically to work with the community on population health needs, being fed some ideas by the public health people and by her community health workers. I, we don't have this time, paid time, expected time set aside in our job description. Now, of course, you can make it, so you can choose to do it. We are autonomous, and I would recommend it, but still, it speaks a big message if people are saying, part of your job, and here it is, and here's the system that helps you to do it. Um, even bigger problem maybe if you are in a, a, you know, running your own clinic, buying just a room, your registered population is people who come to you and like to come with you, but it's not so community-based. So I have seen this, that colleagues will say, well, I can look at who hasn't come for their checkups, but I can't do a community project because there are 10 or 20 doctors all serving this town and we don't have a geographical or a you know, particular setting. So it also depends a bit on the system you work in. Still, it's possible to do something, but you see what I mean. So money, structures, expectations, and your own time, of course. Oh, the skills in the team is the other thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be the doctor. I saw a fantastic model in Iran where the main analyst was the community health worker. It was part of her job. And then she would bring, you know, we have 12 people with indoor fires still, what shall we do? So, you know, this kind of, in the, if you have the skill set in the team, that can help. It doesn't have to be you going out all the time. You want to come to the mic and ask me? <laughs> if you don't mind. No, yeah. no please. Um, I would like just to comment to the two of the main ideas you uh, were speaking about. Uh, the training uh, with students and with, tr with uh, the trainees, sometimes it's difficult to get the idea into them of empowering patients, of the idea of empathy with, with patients. Sometimes it's a new thing that we are talking about. And in the, last, in the past few years, we, are, we were talking about this actually in the general practice uh, world. So I would like you to comment if you, have, if you are struggling uh, with that with uh, the, the students. And also another idea that the surveys with patients, we here in Portugal sometimes we do it uh, and we implement it to have the feedback of patients. And sometimes <coughs> family doctors are a little bit afraid of the opinion of the, the feedback. So I, am I doing it wrong? And sometimes they don't understand that it's the improvement of quality of care. I would like you to comment those two ideas, sure. please. Thank you. Yes. Both very good questions, very briefly, and then I guess we have to move on. Um, I did a, the first question, when I did my master's in education, I looked at the impact on the first cohort of students who went out earlier in my old medical school. And I thought they would say, oh, I learned more medicine or I understood better about chronic disease. And what they, the main thing they said was, the patients and the doctors and the team in primary care treated me like a person. And the article I wrote from that was called Patient-Centered Practice Through Student-Centered Learning. So I think if we really, you know, it is scary. And maybe this also pertains to your second question, but if we want to be, to encourage empathy 
and openness and a genuine human engagement, as well as good professional judgment and competency, we have to really uh, nourish our students and our residents as we would nourish our patients. And that will give people the confidence and the competence to engage themselves in this way. The other thing we do is more technical. We you know, make sure they feel safe so we don't choose the most difficult patients for week one, year one. We choose nice people. And then as you know, we get older, they can do more difficult things. But also we simulate. So we have uh, scenarios, we use actors or we use for consultation skills and we rehearse before you do it. Just the same principle. Take blood from a dummy before you do it from a human being. Try out asking difficult questions about domestic violence and safety with, in a safe situation before you do it for real. And then people can exercise and get feedback in a safe way. And similarly with the surveys, I think it's always hard to be told you've got to do something. It's always much nicer to choose to do it, but it is part of accountability. And sometimes if, that's where I think sometimes having a patient group in your practice can make sense of some of the comments. And also obeying the golden rules. So our, I, we've just started doing something. I'm finding it really nice. The receptionist is sending a good comment. If she sees something on the survey, she says, read this one, guys. And it kind of balances the part where you read and you think, oh, no, we still haven't got enough appointments and the phone line still doesn't work. So I think it's part of professionalism to accept that we should learn from these things, again, in the training. But at the same time, to make sure that when we get that feedback, we balance the good with the bad, or we, we read it at a time when we're not feeling vulnerable even. That's what I meant about making a safe time in the team to have these difficult discussions. Because if you do it at the end of the day when you're already a bit sad and tired and want to be at home, guess what? You feel afraid. So something, does that make sense? It's enough probably, timekeeper. Thank you very much. Now I call Salme Azevedo. Hello, everyone. So I'm a little bit nervous because I'm a biomedical engineer and I just see doctors, so I'm afraid <laughs> that my medical terminology is going to be a mess. So we're all on the team. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, I remember back when I was in university talking with our professors from the medical university where we, we were always very afraid of committing some kind of mistake. So I think it's a trauma. Um, so I'm going to talk about patient innovation. Uh, I'm going to replace uh, Professor Elena Kenyan. She is our chief medical officer. She is in charge of the screening process of the, the solutions that I'm going to show you. And I want you to forget uh, all about medicine and think about technology. And si from simple technology to high tech. And uh, I'm going to start with um, a game, okay? That I normally do, I'm in charge of the engineering presentations, so I normally do with my colleagues, and I believe that you are up to, to the game. Uh, I don't know if you know any of these stories. If you have, you can raise your hand and we can discuss, but I'm going to explain each one, and then I want you to think uh, in what they all have in common, okay? So the first one is um, process engineer, and um, he was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, and um, the doctor said that he had to be submitted to uh, a long uh, surgery, and he was going to be dependent on anticoagulants for the rest of his life. But he's a um, rock, play, uh, rock guitar player, and he didn't want to be conditioned to a normal, very passive lifestyle. So he went back home, and he started thinking about his aorta and comparing his aorta to uh, plumbing in the like a, um, like in their in their house in his house. 
So he thought, when the plum starts losing um, rigidity, what do we do? We buy tape and we wrap around the plum, right? And we get it to, to be fixed again. So he thought, well, maybe my, we, I can do that with my aorta too. The materials may be different, but we can do that. So he's from London. He went to the, the Royal Hospital and shared this with his doctor. What do you think it was the reaction? <laughs> well, you are wrong. The doctor just loved it and said, well, let's not take uh, tape. Let's think about biomaterials and try to customize your aorta and create um, a support that would mimic the tape and would fix um, the, the walls of the aorta. So 15 years have passed. The diameter didn't change, and it was the first patient uh, diagnosed with Marfan syndrome to be submitted to a short-term surgery with no dependence on anticoagulants. Uh, this solution has, is spreading a lot, uh, um, in Europe. It's medical device type three, so you know better than me what are the rules, and the, pro the process is really slow, and is trying to get into US. Now over 50 patients have been submitted to this surgery and have this solution in their hearts, so it's quite amazing. Now, the second solution, and I can tell you uh, that this solution was the one that made me fall in love with, uh, with this project, because my spe I specialized in biomechanics, and I've sp I spent two years studying prosthesis, and when I figured out that the patient did one better than the best top labs in the world, I was like, well, what am I, am I doing in university? Because these guys are coming with better solutions than us. So this is Hook Her, he's North American, and uh, he was a professional climber. He didn't finish high school. Um, but one day everything collapsed because he had an accident and he had to amputate both of his legs. So his dream just ended. And he got really depressed, but he started looking at prosthesis online and he didn't have money enough to buy uh, good ones and the good ones wouldn't enable him to continue his favorite hobby that was uh, climbing. So he started creating his own, his own um, prosthesis. And if we go back to the Pirates movies, and we see that they are very in common. Their his first prototype of prosthesis were based on metal, wood, and they were very robust, made in a garage. Well, he got the attention of MIT Media Lab and said, this, this is awesome. If you are doing this with so simple material, what can you do with high-tech material? and he created the first bionic prosthesis. So he's now in charge of uh, a group uh, in MIT Media Lab, and he's doing, um, he's improving the, the prosthesis. Uh, one of my advice is to, to check his talk about all his experience, because he's now, he is now working with ve war, war veterans and people from that um, were victims of the Boston Marathon accident a few years ago, and. Uh, got amputated. Now, the third example is, uh, is from Israel, is Emit Goffer. And after uh, uh, his um, soldier duty, he, he got back to uh, uh, work, and one day he had an accident, a car accident, and he got tetraplegic, so he couldn't walk. And his main frustration was not uh, being able to walk, but being able, again, to see the people eye to eye. So being stand up and look to the other person in the eyes. And he was completely uh, disappointed with technology and with the industry, because if you think clearly, the wheelchair didn't change since centuries ago. So a person that is, that is in a wheelchair doesn't see the other person with the same dignity that the people that can stand up do. So for him, the thing was, no, I'm going to be able to stand up and talk with my wife and talk with my parents, again, looking in their eyes. So he created the first solution that is on your right, 
and this is the first commercial exoskeleton. So think about superheroes, <laughs> and I think you are getting there. And um, he created this exoskeleton. I, I, I'm not sure if you know how it works, but he has clutches, right? So we can command the, the, um, the, um, the legs with the, the clutches, with the movement of the clutches, okay? But there's a problem. Emit Koffer cannot use his own solution because it's tetraplegic. So after he helped a lot of people, a lot of people tried to help him coming up with this escalator, segway combination of things. So it's, it's like an elevator, it's, it can be sit and then it's put in the standard position. So he finally was able to look to a person in the eyes. So now the question is, what do they all have in common? Come on. Yeah, there's, there's a need behind the three solutions. They were f dealing with this need every single day. And the industry and the academics and the research centers don't deal daily with the need. They know they are aware of the need, but they don't deal with that. And these guys, they were not afraid, afraid of risking and start developing something that would simply solve that need. They were not aware about the market. They, they were not thinking about profit. They were just thinking about getting a solution. And they got the top three solutions uh, of nowadays. So we found these solutions and then we found a lot more solutions because, so getting back a little bit, we are a research project in a business school in Lisbon, Catolica, and we were studying like users coming up with new solutions, fighting the, the industry and so on, and then we find out solutions in healthcare. So like, okay, let's see if this works. We did a lot of research and we found several solutions, so we decided to try to understand what, was, what would be the impact of this phenomena if, would, if it was studied deeply. So just looking at the rare diseases, 8% of the world population have rare diseases. They, all of them experience needs in their own way. So maybe they have incredible solutions that we don't know. So let's try to figure out more about what should be the, the impact of a patient having a disease and if, they, if the, this patient is doing something to cope with a need that doctors, engineers, research centers are not looking at because doctors are worried about the diagnosis, are worried, are worried of improving their lives, but they don't deal with their habits of the daily life. So we start, the, the first thing in the health sector that we did was to do a contract between the producer and the user. The producer, let's talk, producer RS, like the, the suspicious of the, the innovations. So, and the users are patients and informal caregivers that deal with this every single day. If we look back, we, we know that rare diseases and some, of us, and some needs very specific to some diseases are small markets for the industry. So the industry has, are not going to invest in trying to solve a need for 10 or 15 people out of 1,000. Um, patients know their needs, but they don't know, they are, they, sometimes they don't know how to express their need to the others. So people with more capacities, with more education, cannot understand and try to find a solution. And the third point was that there are more patients than producers. So maybe there are more innovations on the user side than on the producer side. So we came up with three steps to, for our research designs and methods. The first one was to find evidence of this phenomena, try to understand what were their motivations, what were the solutions, were they technical enough or were they very simple? What, were the, what was the impact of these solutions? Then we decided to go and survey um, 500 patients uh, in Portugal and try to figure out if the phenomenon is also uh, um, present in Portugal. And then we decided to create a platform, like a social network, that would um, facilitate the sharing of these solutions online. So this knowledge could be used for, by everyone in the world. 
So I'm going to, to talk about three more cases. I hope that I'm still in time. And uh, everything starts with a need, so we start with that. And Lisa Kreitz created the shower shirt. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. She did a uh, mastectomy, and the, the recuperation was really hard. But for her, the problem was that she was not able to take a shower. And she was, she's quite nice, but she's a, a journalist from North America and she's very like, she wants to be very beautiful all the time. And for her taking two or three times, th three months without taking a shower was impossible. It was not acceptable and she had to create something. So she tried to find a solution. Uh, she dig, she dig, uh, she dig deep the, the internet. She couldn't find. She asked their doctors. She, they, they didn't have a solution. You should, you should stay. You should keep calm. Please don't, don't put in contact with water. You know it's prejudicial. So don't do it. Okay, but she did. She did it. So she start, She took trash bags and she starts wrap around around his chest, her chest, in order to take a shower. Things got a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to take to go deep on this. Uh, but she didn't give up, so she came up with the first catch of what should be um, a garment that would protect her uh, from uh, water contact. Uh, a lot of people tried to help her, and she came up with this solution that was approved by FDA as a medical device type one, has been commercialized all over, uh, has been distributed in US. Uh, Russia, Dubai, uh, and I, I'd like to point out Dubai here because of the culture, the differences in culture. In culture, we we went with Lisa to Dubai to uh, to show this project, and they they were so impressed with this solution that they bought several units because. Uh, breast cancer is a problem in Dubai, not because of the disease, but because of the, um, the problem that they don't talk about prevention. They, don't, they cannot talk, or they can, but they don't want to talk with women and say, please uh, try to see if you are finding something different on your breasts and come to see me. So when the women go, go to the hospital, hospital, they are already in the, the last stage and they have to submit it to, to, to the worst scenario. So this solution has changed a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the recuperation stages of a lot of patients and now is being used not only for uh, mastectomy um, patients but all other patients that are submitted to cardiothoracic surgeries. Um, so then we have Michael Series. Michael Series has uh, Crohn was diagnosed with Crohn uh, syndrome uh, disease, Crohn disease, and uh, after several surgeries, he had to be uh, he, he did a transplant of the small bowel. Uh, so he was with a, an ostomy bag for the rest of, the, of his life. But the problem for him was that uh, the ostomy bag, was, it was easy to adapt to that, but uh, he, he didn't know how he could control the volume of the bag. And he wanted to keep going with his friends to the coffee shop, to the conference, to the cinema, but for him, open the bag and check the volume was impossible, so he had to spend, he had to go f several times to the toilet just to check and he start becoming, he, he, he start feeling frustrated with that and he isolated himself from, from, the, from his fr family and friends. And he decided that that should not be the solution. So he hacked a, a Wii control, you know, the Wii game, the Wii console. He hacked the Wii, con the, the Wii console and uh, took the sensor and the, attached to the ostomy bag to measure the volume of the, um, of the bag. Uh, this solution was so uh, val valid in the hospital where he was um, doing all his treatments that they incentivized, they uh, made them pursue with this and be turned this into a commercial product. That's how we created the OSAMI alert sensor. Has, is being um, distributed in US and in UK. Is a medical device type 1, 2, and it's a success, I can tell you. Um, everything can be controlled by a smartwatch or by 
um, by a smartphone, you get a message saying, go to the toilet. It's almost done. <laughs> so it's, it's, really, it's really cool, I can tell. <laughs> also. Now, the third case and final, the final case is Ukena Shinozuka. This is a different case. So this is an informal caregiver, caregiver need. And is, Kenneth is that young guy over there. He's 20 years old, but he's a genius. Uh, his grandfather has Alzheimer's, and the problem was to keep uh, his grandfather safe during night because he, he had t he tended to wander off uh, the house, if sometimes leaving the house, and that was becoming a problem. Nobody in the family w was resting. They were making shifts to keep the, the grandfather um, uh, supervised. So we decided to create a sensor to put in the, in the socket. So every time that the grandfather would try to get out of bed, an alert is sent to, to, to the, care, the closest caregiver's uh, phone. Already, also, you can see that it's a success. In the US, it's already in a lot of hospitals, in clinical centers and rehabilitation centers that uh, are, have these patients with these conditions of wandering off. And uh, when it reached Portugal, we presented this in, uh, we, we gave him an award uh, because we create a, a uh, um, celebration to, to give an award, an, an award to the best innovation from patients, caregivers, and collaborators. And when he was here a lot of, in Lisbon, a lot of people want, wanted to talk to him to, buy, to try to buy the product. So, for 500, the, if you remember, we did the survey with 500 patients. We figured out that 80%, 8%, so almost 40, 40 solutions, were completely new to the world for the doctors that were judging the solutions presented by these, uh, by these patients. So patients and informal caregivers. So now extrapolate 8% in a small country like Portugal. What should be the rest of the world? That's, that's our point. And we decided to come up with this platform because when we were asking these, these guys why w nobody knows about your solutions, we figured out that uh, they were feeling either two of, one of these two things, humiliated by their own condition or disease, so they didn't want to share a solution like Michael Sears one. It's not... It's, it's not very good to talk about, sorry the term, shit, right? So nobody talks about complicated, uh, or it's not complicated, uncomfortable topics. So nobody tells what are the solutions that they do in order to cope with these dramatic situations. And the other was they don't believe that the solutions they created were important for the others. They think, well, this is my problem. So I created the solution for my problem. And they don't understand that their problems can be others' problems. And I think in here, and I'm an engineer, I don't talk to patients, and I think if I had to talk with them, I would say yes to everything or either run away. But if I could give you an advice, ask them what they are doing or creating to solve their problems for the daily life. You are the ones responsible to take care of the treatment, diagnosis, whatever. They are the ones responsible to take care of simple solutions of how to eat, how to drink, how to walk, how to go to the toilet. Ask them. Take one minute to ask them that. And we created this platform that patients can anonymously, if they want, or publicly share their solutions. We have, uh, I'm sorry, we have 800 solutions so far. And I think I don't have a lot of time yet, so I just I have to go. Uh, and uh, we have 800 solutions for all over the world. And this is our last example of a collaboration between our team and one patient and one collaborator of creating the first 3D printed prosthesis to a Portuguese boy called Nuno, seven years old, two years ago, and it was a success. So can I just pass the movie, please? And then I promise I finish. I'm sorry. I don't wanna be 
So this is a 3D printed machine, printing machine, if you don't know. It enables us to print really fast a prosthesis. In one day, I can have a, a prosthesis ready to go and to share with a, to, to deliver to a kid. So it's quite awesome. We should have one in every single hospital to do this. This is our team doing. This is the guy that created the solution. So he created a solution. He's from North America, but a guy in South Africa uh, lost three fingers when he was. Um, uh, he's a carpenter. Carpenter when he was working, and uh, he saw. I don't know. And, YouTube movie about uh, a hand like Edward Caesar's hands, you know, a big one. So they created three uh, fingers for for Richard. Then a mother of uh, a young kid called Liam found out that uh, an American was uh, in that village and went there and asked the, her, him to do a prosthesis like this one for Liam that was born um, without Half, uh, without the hand, and I've no one created a model that is open source and then it can be downloaded all over the world and printed in one day or less to be given to children. This solution is completely free. Anyone can do it, cannot commercialize it, and every kid can have one. This was the first. This was the first one that we did, and it was really amazing. An, ama an amazing experience, I, uh, I guess. This is family. This is Professor Elena Kangam, who is not here. Participa no Challenge Day da Patient Innovation em www.patient-innovation.com Thank you and sorry for the extra time. <laughs> Uh, thank you for this very inspiring presentation on the power of patience, the innovative power of patience. I think the presentation went very well. I hope that increases your self and com your confidence for the next time. You're doing fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I, I can imagine you could spend another half hour, an hour with more <laughs> solutions and more oh, yeah, problems. So, so let's see if the audience has questions for you on this presentation. Who can I invite for questions? Yes, sir. Hi, um, I'm from Switzerland. I have a question about um, something that I saw online at one point, and I just wanted to know if you knew anything about it, a project for parents who have children who are born um, tetraplegic or incapable of actually using their limbs, and they have a sort of exoskeleton that you build onto the parents ah, yeah, yeah. so that their kids can walk, can actually yeah, find out what it's like to feel walking. I don't know um, if, I, if I have... Uh, a, I don't think I have a slide, but... That's my way to, to make you go to, my, to our website. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So this is our website. I should have, if, my, if Elena Kenyan was here, she was going to kill me because I always talk too much and don't talk about everything. And so it's called Epsi. Ah, okay. And it maybe it's this one, I don't, I'm not sure. It does ring a bell, Epsi. Okay, so this is like an harness that helps Thank you for coming. This is one of my also favorite solutions, but <laughs> I didn't have time. So uh, um, 
she's from Israel too, and she created this because uh, his son was born with the cerebral, cerebral palsy. Pal cerebral yes. palsy. And she, this was the first prototype. You can, I don't know if you could see. Uh, she, she was not okay with the, her doctors and physiotherapists saying that, please give up, he's not going to walk. He's not going to be able to stand up. And she no, no, no. He's going to be included in the family activities, so I'm going to do it. She created, uh, for doctors, would be they, they, you wouldn't like, because the first prototypes were based on uh, ropes, yet she attached the kid to the back, to the, to the front, to the back, and so on. But she was getting really tired because the kid was growing up, getting more weight, so she, come up, she came up with these garners. Uh, that sh that sh that is being sell online in all over the world. The first it only the first company that accept this product was an, Ar an Irish company, and in the f the first night that they start uh, selling this online, the website went down because there were so many people trying to buy the product that it's simple pff, low. Yes, this is a uh, one of uh, one of our, one of our solutions. She won the the, uh, the first edition award in in Lisbon, the the first innovation award. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? My question to you is: Are you invited to speak at the students in the Catholica University or for residents? Is this part of your program also? Uh, yeah, we, we, as we want to share the, our message to everyone, we accept all the, all the type of talks. But you did but already. Yeah, I did for business school, not medical school. So there's an opportunity. I think the medical students yep. are, could learn something from this, from the innovative power of patients and Caregivers. support yep. they can get on developing things. I look around for the last time, otherwise I would like to ask Professor... Oh, there is another question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is about patent. Do your products uh, are submitted to patent or are they freely to be used over while <coughs> in the old world? Lovely question. So that's another, uh, another thing that... Uh, our platform is only a venue to share solutions. So if the, the patients or the caregivers want to become entrepreneurs and try to commercialize their solutions, they norm, we normally, what we normally do is to talk to them before they share the solution. So only after they get a patent, they should be able to share the solution online. Because as soon as you share something online, you lose the rights. So if they, have, they, are, they intend to commercialize, we say, wait get a patent, protect this, and then share. If they say no, as Ivan Owen with the prosthesis, if he wants just to share, anyone can do it, adapt, whatever, yeah, go f for free. But we are not in charge of that. We just give an advice. It's, it's our part. Okay, can I ask Professor Amanda how to come on the stage too? So if there are any more questions also for her presentation? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pepper from Bulgaria. I want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I want to invite you to the annual GP meeting in my country in the end of September. I think it's very inspiring and it shows how we can learn from patients and how we can work with other professionals. This is a wonderful, wonderful example of the power of working together. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Well, thank you, Professor Amanda Howe. Thank you, Salome Azevedo. Thank you for your presentations, enlightening and strengthening the, the power of patients, teaming up together. I think I can invite you all to lunch, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. Oh. <laughs> Oh, the next night session is starting now, not lunch yet. Yeah. <laughs> not lunch. Uh, another housekeeping advice. Does anyone is registered to the dinner but doesn't have a ticket yet? If that is the case, please go to the 
registration office. But at lunch, now it's the next session. And not voting. Oh, well, there's something